it's a pleasure to be here to talk to a programming language and compiler community because there's been a bunch of recent work that I'll talk about at the end and taking some of these algorithmic ideas and incorporating them into compilers. So let me just have two slides of preaching to the choir here about why it's important to avoid communication. So algorithms have two costs, whether you measure them in time or energy. It's the arithmetic and the communication, which is moving data, either between levels of a memory hierarchy or between processors over a network. And so the uh, simple performance model we're gonna use for most of this talk is gonna count three things. Uh, three things that depend on your algorithm, which are the number of flops, the number of words moved along any one of those wires in that picture I showed you, and the number of messages, a message being a bunch of words concatenated together and sent as one chunk. And then there are three parameters that depend on the, on the architecture, the time per flop, the bandwidth, and the latency. And it's well known that these three uh, terms, um, the, the time per flop, which I'll call gamma as we go forward, and the reciprocal of the bandwidth, which I'll call beta, and the latency, which is alpha, are orders of magnitude apart and growing apart exponentially. So with Dave Patterson's permission, I stole some data from a table in, in the first chapter of his recent textbook with, David, with um, John Hennessy. And I've plotted on a log scale all these different alphas and betas and gammas over a long period of time to see these exponential trends up to about 2017. So the blue line at the bottom is the time per flop. It's at the bottom. And then you can see that the, uh, the alphas, the latencies are by far the worst. And, and there are several curves here because I have bandwidth and latency both for ethernet and for DRAM. And so whether you're worried, and, it's a, and I should also add, it's the same story for energy. If I were to make a plot for energy, it would be the same thing. So whether you're worried about say how long the cell phone, uh, the battery in your cell phone will be alive or the million dollars per megawatt per year it costs to run your data center or how long your drone can stay in the air, you want to avoid communication. So here are the goals uh, for the talk. We want to redesign algorithms to avoid communication. And that means along all levels of the memory hierarchy and across the network. And we're going to, in particular, have a lot of lower bounds and that we've derived for these things, which are going to be the, you know, going to compilers eventually at the end of the talk. And when we first derive these lower bounds, we compare them to classical algorithms that have been used for many years. And the, these classical algorithms are often very, very far from the lower bounds. And so that motivated us to you know, invent a whole bunch of new algorithms that did attain the lower bounds and got very large speed ups. And so, and so now the question is, how can we automate the implementation of these particular algorithms? So, here, I'm gonna give you some examples of speed ups that we've gotten over time. And there are different approaches that we've taken. And the first one is uh, doing the same operations. So we're not changing the algorithm at that, in that sense, but we're just doing them in a different order. And so you can think of this as a tiling kind of thing. And so uh, one of our early results was we found a different way to tile matrix multiply, which was asymptotically faster than what was known before. Uh, which is surprising because matrix multiply is well studied. And that gave us a 12x speed up. Uh, and I'll explain that algorithm in more detail later. Then we, we realized it also worked for sparse times dense matrix multiplication, which is a very common operation in machine learning and other places. And that gave a 100x speed up over the previous best algorithm. It's not just linear algebra, you know, it, it's going to turn out just to depend on the, you know, the structure of the loops and, the, and what the uh, loop indices look like. And so for Floyd Warshall, all pairs shortest path, there was a 6.2x speed up. And it's not just, you know, three nested loops, it's very, very general. And so for the direct end body, there was another 12x speed up. So the next level of change is that we're going to have to change the algorithm in order to make improvements but we're gonna get a mathematically identical answer uh, modulo round off, which is an issue. And so uh, an algorithm that I'm gonna go into more detail later on is the QR decomposition. So a least squares problem for a tall skinny matrix, many more rows and columns. And that gave us a 13 X speed up over the previous one, uh, solving a symmetric eigenvalue problem. So now the next one is, is sparse linear algebra. And so there it required a, a different set of ideas in order to you know, avoid communication because the bottleneck there is a sparse matrix uh, vector multiply, which doesn't allow speed up. So that required a very different reorganization. And then also some machine learning algorithms like coordinate descent lasso. And then finally, uh, if you're, all you're interested in is telling the difference between dogs and cats, you have a lot of room for algorithmic innovation. 
And so we can have a different algorithm and a di different approximate answer. And that gives us even more room to avoid communication. And so for uh, support vector machines, there was a 16x speed up. And for faster image net training, uh, 135x speed up. And so these are just a few examples. And this work has been well recognized. Um, when I was teaching the parallel matrix multiply algorithm in my parallel computing course a few years ago, a student thought it was a good idea, created a startup, and the startup was acquired by Intel in 2016. Um, the, that work, uh, and completely independent work, uh, Torsten Hoffler at ETH uh, took the lower bound that we had uh, derived and improved it by a factor of two and improved the algorithm by a small factor, and now they match. So now the upper bound and the lower bound are actually equal, and that won a best paper prize at Supercomputing 19, a completely independent work. The uh, work on tall skinny QR run, won another best paper prize. We got it out in LAPAC back in 2016, and more recently, we updated it so that the output is now identical to the usual output. As I said, we got a mathematically different algorithm that included a different data structure. And since people wanted to have the same data structure, we had to figure out how to, in a communication avoiding way, recreate the usual data structure. The support vector machine won another best paper prize. And the ImageNet training not only won a be another best paper prize, but the idea behind it was adopted by the industry standard benchmark MLPerf. So now it's the way people you know, run all their benchmarks for machine le uh, learning. So lots of different possibilities here. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to start with linear algebra, and I'll tell you what the lower bounds are. I'll go into a little bit more detail on matrix multiply and tall skinny QR, and then just say a little bit about iterative methods. Then I'll talk about machine learning, and I'll talk about that big speed up that I just mentioned of 135x and where that came from. And by the way, 135x was on, 120 by, on 128 processors increase. So it's super linear speed up. And so you can guess why that is. I'll tell you later. And then to get a little closer to the theory that underlies of all this, we'll talk about uh, how to beat uh, matrix multiply for convolutional neural nets, for inference, I should say. And then the question is, how does all this generalize in a way that, that could <clears throat> potentially go into compilers? All of these were sort of well understood, you know, three nested loop kind of things. But it turns out it generalizes to arbitrary code algorithms that can be expressed as nested loops accessing arrays with affine subscripts. We can derive lower bounds and optimal algorithms for that very general class. And let's just say there's, you know, there's still a lot of open problems, and I'll get there. And there's a lot of work. I'll just pick one, cherry pick one example where uh, we can improve things. And that's where you do variable precision and need to take that into account. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about integration into compilers, which a lot of people are working on now. And this is very uh, you know, current work. And so it's going to be just a sketch of, of possibilities. So let's do the uh, communication lower bounds for classical direct linear algebra. Um, so direct linear algebra means things like solving AX equal B, least squares, eigenvalue problems, uh, SVD, and so forth. And so we have lower bounds on all of these, which are the same as the classical one we've known for matrix multiply for a long time, which I'll tell you, remind you what that is in the next slide. And when we derive these, we realize they were mostly not attained by the algorithms and standard libraries, including the ones we're responsible for, like LAPAC and Scalapack. So we needed new algorithms to attain these lower bounds. And sometimes it was just doing the same operations in a different order, but in many cases we needed you know, new mathematical algorithms and new data structures, so it wasn't just loop transformations. And I should say that the theory tells you in theory what the best tile sizes are and everything like that, but there is all that doesn't, the model alpha beta gamma doesn't capture every detail of an architecture. And in fact, I'll talk about that later, you know, how do you, you know, have a more detailed uh, model and so what people often do is auto-tuning to choose those uh, tiling parameters and so forth and more, and, uh, more accurately. And we have a project in that area too. A lot of people work on it. Ours is called GPTune, which is based on um, uh, Bayesian modeling. And for sparse matrices, it's going to depend very much on the sparsity structure. It's the same lower bound, it turns out, works for sparse matrices and dense matrices. 
But you know, sometimes you can't tile if the matrix is too sparse. If you're multiplying by a diagonal matrix, there's no magic that you can do because there's no data reuse. But the lower bounds still apply. And let me just say the same thing applies for iterative linear algebra. You know, we have new lower bounds and new algorithms for those as well. And I'll just sort of sketch that. So here's the lower bound for everything that smells like three nested loops. And I'll have a more formal definition of smells like later, but right now right your intuition is just fine. So let's suppose we have a two level memory hierarchy and the fast memory is of size capital M, which is probably too small to fit your data. And you can think of this as applying to parallel processors too. And so you can think of, the, I'm going to have a lower bound on the number of words moved either between you know, cache of size M and fast memory and slow memory or between my local processor and all the other processors in the network. And the lower bound is the number of flops assigned to that processor divided by the square root of its local memory size. And so for matrix multiply, this reproduces the classical N cubed over M to the one half that uh, Kong, uh, Hung, and, uh, Kung and Hong uh, proved in 1981. So it's been around for a long time, but it's much more general. So in the parallel case, in order to apply this, we need to assume that you know, there's some load balancing going on. So if you want to avoid communication in the parallel case, you could just have one processor do everything, but that wouldn't be very useful. So typically you assign you know, one piece of all the work to each of the P processors. And so that's what would go in the numerator here. Uh, Jim, there's a question uh, in the chat. Um, is, uh, do you have some intuition for why that's the lower bound? It's not obvious to me. Yes, so, so there's, I, I will get to that later. Okay, thank you. Yes. So um, yes, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna go into it as, into as much detail, but I'll certainly give you a link to you know, why that is true. Thank you. So when we uh, originally, uh, so as I said, this has been known since 1981 for the sequential case for matrix multiply doing the usual N cube kind of algorithms. But then we realized it holds for just about everything else. It smells like nested loops, all the blahs, uh, Gaussian elimination, LUQR, eigenvalues, SVDs, tensor contractions. Of course, tensors can have many uh, nested, you know, can have many dimensions. They can have, uh, you know, many subscripts, many, many nested loops, but it's still the same bound. It turns out the mathematics extends to that. It also applies to some whole programs where you're not just doing one of these operations, but you may do, be doing a sequence of matrix multiplies to compute a power of a matrix. It's the same lower bound. And as I said, it applies to dense and sparse matrices. In that case, the number of flops isn't n cubed anymore. It can be much, much smaller. And of course, if your matrix is diagonal, we probably don't have any data reuse. We can't attain it, but the lower bound theory still applies. It applies to both the sequential and parallel case. And we don't have to be doing multiplies and adds in the inner loop, you know, linear algebra. We could be doing graph theory. So floyd Warshall, it's the same tree nested loops. It's the same theory. And that's where the speed ups come from. So we also have a lower bound on latency. Now, where does that come from? And the simplest way to get a lower bound on latency is say that let's at every step send the largest possible message. That would minimize the number of messages. What's the largest possible message? It's just the whole memory. So if I assume that all the messages are as large as possible, I just take this lower bound for the bandwidth and I divide by M and that's the lower bound for the number of messages. And that is also, for many of these attainable, in some cases we have tighter lower bounds. You can't attain this for Gaussian elimination, but you can always get this bandwidth lower bound for all of these. And this won a, a, a prize back in 2012. So now let's go on to more of the details about uh, matrix multiply and how you can beat the classical tiling. So here is the uh, the well-known algorithm that's been used for decades for multiplying two uh, matrices in parallel, it's called SUMA. And so suppose I have N by N matrices laid out on P processors on a P to the one half by P to the one half processor grid. So each of these blocks here represents both a processor and a submatrix. So this N over four by N over four submatrix is assigned to that processor and so forth. So what does the algorithm do? It's going to do an outer product it's going to take this block of columns, multiply it by this block of rows and update the matrix and march across. And so at every step, what it needs to do, what each processor will do, it will take its submatrix that it owns, if it owns one and broadcast it sideways. So every one of these processors in its row gets a copy. This processor that owns that sub block of rows of B will broadcast it down. So everybody there gets a copy. 
then every processor will receive some rows, re receive some columns, receive some rows, and then do a local matrix multiply and update its local processor. And, and that's, been, that's a very natural parallel algorithm, been around for a long time. And it turns out, good news, it attains the lower bound in a under a certain assumption. So what is the lower bound in this case? So let me assume that I'm, I, have, I use as little memory as necessary. That's a reasonable assumption. So I have order n, so I have n by n matrices. So the total memory is, is 3n squared. And so each processor is going to use n squared over p memory. It's going to do, how much work is it going to do? That's the numerator. It's going to do n cubed over p flops divided by that. And there is the lower bound. And that is wonderfully attained by the SUMA algorithm I just showed you. And the number of messages, which is a factor of uh, m, uh, m smaller, is also attained by SUMA if you let those blocks be large enough. So SUMA attains this lower bound. And so when we saw this, we went and looked at all the algorithms in Scalapack you know, for Gaussian elimination, parallel Gaussian elimination and whatnot. And the good news was for the words moved, they mostly did attain this particular lower bound, but except for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. That was a much harder one. But for the number of messages sent, they were all asymptotically worse, except for Koleski. So we went back to the drawing board and we came up with new algorithms for all of these that attained the lower bounds up to polylog factors for both the number of messages moved and the number of words. So some of these are very, you know, are you know very practical, used in practice. Some of them are still kind of theoretical, uh, and uh, but you know they do exist, you know, in, in a big O sense. So then we asked ourselves, can we do better than this particular assumption here? So that's like a kind of a crazy question. Aren't we already optimal? But I made this assumption that I was using as little memory as uh, as necessary. So that, which means one copy of all the data spread out over all the processors. But the lower bound is still true if we use more memory. The lower bound does not fail. So the question is, can, if we allow ourselves to have more memory, can we attain this smaller lower bound? Because remember, M is in the denominator. So making M bigger makes the bound smaller. And it turns out there was a special case <clears throat> that had been known for decades where they assumed they could have exactly P to the one third copies of all the data. So they, where p is a number of processors. So if you have p to the one third copies of all the memory, then you can uh, go asymptotically faster and hit that lower bound. And this has been rediscovered many times. Here are a few examples. But it obviously, you know, if you have a thousand processors, you might not have 10 times the memory, uh, you know, needed to store all of your data. And so the question is, can we always hit the lower bound no matter how much extra memory we have? And that is this 2.5D algorithm you know, that, uh, that I was telling you about. So let's assume we can fit not just one copy of the data, but we can fit C copies of the data. C is the number of copies. And so maybe you can afford two copies or four copies or whatever, it depends on your hardware. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna lay out our P processors in this three-dimensional grid, and they're gonna be C layers, where C is the number of copies, and each layer is gonna get a copy of the data. And so here's an example of our, our layout if I have 32 processors and enough memory to copy everything twice. So what is the algorithm going to do? It's very simple. I'll explain it here with these indices. So I'll assume that initially all my data is laid out on the top layer. So that processor will own that n over 4 by n over 4 submatrix of A and B and so forth. Then the way the algorithm is going to work is that each processor at the top will broadcast its copies of A and B down. So I'll have redundant copies in each of the C layers. Then at each layer, <clears throat> the algorithm is going to run one seeth of that SUMA algorithm. It's going to compute one seeth of all the partial sums that you need to compute for the matrix multiply. And when I'm done with that, all the partial sums that I need to add to one another are going to be stacked in a vertical, you know, vertically here. And then all I need to do is a, is a reduction, uh, a sum reduce vertically to get all the partial sums to get the true sum sitting on the top layer. And so that is the algorithm. And so let me just show you how much speed up you get from doing this, uh, up to 12x. It depends on you know, how big your matrix is. And so here is um, the vertical axis is the execution time, uh, normalized by uh, to you know, the classical algorithm where I have one copy of the data uh, being here. And here's the new algorithm, how much faster it is. So that's 12x faster. And I've broken it down into the time spent communicating the time spent idle 
and the time spent actually doing computation. And so you can see that if for a small matrix, you know, where, you, where it's hard to use 16,000 processors, we were able to get 12x faster. And the, the communication time dropped by 95% in that case. And in fact, even the flop time went faster. That seems rather odd. How could the flops go faster? It's because locally, the matrices that we needed to multiply were larger. So the blahs ran, ran faster at each processor because we were doing larger matrix multiplies. And so the, 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 ground, you know, the basic speed of the inner loop uh, went faster, which is why the green shrank. Now, when we do a much larger matrix, we also got rid of most of the communication. But now, not surprisingly, you know, the commute, compute time is about one third. So we only went 2.7 times faster. But if most of your energy is being spent communicating, we got rid of most of the energy. So that's why it's still a good idea. And the same idea extends to LU and QR and other algorithms, but it's rather more complicated. And I should say <clears throat> that if you do this, you can show that matrix multiply achieves what I'll call perfect strong scaling. So what that means is that if you are running matrix multiply and you double the number of processors, you also double the memory. And if you use all that extra memory, then the flop time goes down by a factor of two, the bandwidth cost goes down by a factor of two, and the latency cost goes down by a factor of two. So everything scales with the number of processors. That's what perfect strong scaling means in time. And for energy, it turns out that it takes no more energy to multiply it twice as fast as it did to, you know, with you know, 2p processors than with p. So how, how does that work? I have twice as many processors. They're all burning power at the same rate, and, but they only run half as long. And so it all cancels and it's the same amount of energy. And this won another uh, paper award. And this, and this was also what they improved by a factor of two, uh, Torsten Hoffler to win another best paper award in SC19. So let me go on to a different algorithm where we needed different mathematics, is not just different tiling. And this is for a tall, skinny QR decomposition. So let's suppose I have a, a tall, skinny matrix spread out over four processors. So processor zero owns those rows of the matrix, and processor one owns those rows, and so forth. So the first step of the algorithm, and I want to factor this into Q orthogonal times R, upper triangular. And so the first thing the algorithm is going to do is without any communication at all, it's just going to do a local QR decomposition on its local data. Uh, and so what have I done mathematically? What I've implicitly done is I factored my matrix into this block diagonal orthogonal matrix times this stack of four triangles, you know, four R matrices. Now that's not the QR decomposition because I only want one triangle over here, but it's the first step. So now I'm going to communicate and these two processors who own these two pair triangles are going to uh, share them with one another and they will do a QR decomposition just of those pairs. This one will do that similarly. And so what have I done? I've done implicitly a QR decomposition of, you know, I've, I've, I've factored this stack of four triangles into an orthogonal matrix times half as many triangles. Well, this is divide and conquer, one more step. I'll take the last two triangles and factor them. And so now what I've done is I've done a QR decomposition and I've, but my Q is now represented as that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that R. And so my output is this particular data structure. And it turns out that anything that you want to do, solve least squares, whatever, with the classical data structure, in which, which would only be one of these, you can do with this data structure just as well. Now, let me just sort of summarize what this is yeah, in terms of a little picture here. What I've basically done is a binary tree reduction. So, and the reduction operator is I take whatever I have and I do a QR decomposition, and then I just pass that up the tree. So that's what this algorithm is doing. It's just basically doing map reduce, where the reduction operation is a QR decomposition. So that's the parallel case. What about a sequential uh, algorithm? So I want to now minimize the amount of data movement uh, from the uh, main memory to the cache. So ideally, I'd like to touch the data once. That's a lower bound. And so it's exactly the same algorithm. I just use a different reduction tree. So I will read in the first n over four rows of the matrix, do QR. I'll read in the next n over four rows, stack R00 on top of W1, do QR. Stack in the next, bring in the next quarter of the rows, bring in the last quarter of the rows, 
And I end up with a QR decomposition, a different format, but, it's, but I've touched the data once. It's a streaming algorithm. And that's obvious. And touching the data once is a lower bound. So you can imagine on a different kind of architecture, a dual core machine, I might have a different reduction tree. And if you have a very, very complicated you know, architecture, heterogeneous with all sorts of network you know, com complexities in it, then I'll just choose the reduction tree dynamically depending on what resources I have available to me. And I'll have a different output data structure, but I can use it for whatever purpose I need. And so that's the mathematical description of the algorithm. Here's some sample speed ups. Some of this data is pretty old. You know, 8x speed up on a you know Intel Cloverton. You can see how old that is. Uh, it was run on four cities in France, connected over the internet, and uh, so grid computing, as it's called, and uh, that got a 4x speed up on four cities. And you can do it, you know, in MapReduce, as I said, and it's basically two calls to MapReduce, and it's you know only like 1.6x slower than just accessing the data twice. The best speed up we had was infinite, and that's where a student was trying to. Uh, run the, time this on his laptop where the matrix was too big to fit in DRAM and it kept thrashing you know the disk and you know he finally just hit control C because he couldn't wait any longer you know and so it turned out that the uh, doing this QR decomposition was only two times as slow as though he had infinite DRAM whereas you know since he was thrashing the disk it didn't run at all you know in that model so this is a streaming algorithm and I should say if you have a tall skinny matrix and you want to do a singular value decomposition, it's the same trick. We get the same speed ups. You start with QR, and then you just do the SVD of R. So in this one, another, as I said, uh, best paper prize. So now let me switch gears and do something very different, which is iterative methods for linear algebra. And so at a high level, what do these algorithms look like? I'm trying to solve either AX equal B or you know, find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the inner loop is doing sparse matrix vector multiplies with A and some starting vector. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some starting vector, do a bunch of sparse matrix vector multiplies, get a bunch of vectors, and find you know, the best linear combination of those vectors to answer my problem. And there's a big literature on these things. They're called Krilov subspace methods. Some of them, like conjugate gradients, GMRES, Lanchos, Arnoldi, there's, you know, years and years of these kinds of methods that we'd like to speed up. And so, uh, and the bottleneck is sparse matrix vector multiply, typically. So in order to make progress, we have to have some assumption about the structure of the matrix. So let me assume the matrix is what I'll call well partitioned. And, you know, a, a canonical example would be a 2D mesh. So everybody is, you know, can only has non-zeros, you know. So think of the graph representing your sparse matrix as a 2D mesh. So you're only connected to your nearest neighbors on a mesh. So the serial version of the algorithm, what does the conventional one do? I'm doing K sparse matrix vector multiplies. The matrix is too big to fit in DRAM. So I have to do K moves of the data of the matrix from slow to fast memory. The new version is going to move the data once from slow to fast memory. And one is a lower bound. What about the parallel case on P processors? If I do it in the conventional way, every time I do the sparse matrix vector multiply, I have to do a dot product or something like that. That's a reduction that costs log p. So I have to do k log p messages for all those k, all those dot products. The new algorithm is going to do one reduction operation or you know, a constant number of reduction operations and still get the same answer. And you know, that is also a lower bound. And so there's lots of speed ups possible. Um, I'm giving you a very high level summary of a lot of work. There's a lot of challenges, like if your matrix is not well partitioned, um, if you're doing preconditioning, which a lot of people do. And there's a lot of tricks to make it numerically stable because everything I, I've described, you know, is identical in exact arithmetic. But of course, floating point is, you know, makes life hard. So let me just give you one example of what this, this operation is for a very simple iterative algorithm called GMRES, where I want to solve AX equal B. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically form a bunch of vectors, B, A, B, A squared, B, blah, blah, blah and find some, the linear combination of those that minimizes the residual. That's what this algorithm does iteratively. And so what's the inner loop look like? I do a matrix vector multiply. I do modified Gram-Schmidt to make that vector orthogonal to all the previous vectors. And then I build a little K by K matrix uh, that I'm going to use you know, later in the algorithm. So this is a small data structure that I need to update. And when I'm done, I solve a little K by K least squares problem. 
So that all fits in cache, no problem. And so there's the bottleneck you know, doing all these matrix vector multiplies. What does the new algorithm do? In one step, it turns out, with one communication, I can compute all of these vectors at once. V, A times V, A squared times V, et cetera. And this spans the same subspace as all of those. And I can, I, I can do this by taking advantage of sparsity uh, and, and partitioning and only bring A from slow to fast memory once. But these are different vectors than the Ws I got over here. So what do I do with them? I do tall skinny QR and I get the Q matrix that I would have gotten over here. Then I can rebuild my H, my little K by K matrix and solve the same least squares problem. And so this in the sequential case, this decreases the number of words moved by a factor of K and the number of messages in the parallel case also by a factor of K. Um, but there's a problem here. If you're a numerical analyst, if I look at all of these vectors, I'm basically running what's called the power method. All of these vectors are getting more and more nearly parallel to one another. Uh, and so I'm losing numerical precision. They're not pointing in different directions. You know, a bunch of parallel vectors is a very bad basis for a subspace. And so numerically, we could fix it by choosing different polynomials. Instead of A squared, it would be a different quadratic. Instead of A cubed, it would be a different cubic. And, we, and it's the same cost, but we can pick those polynomials to keep it all numerically stable. And so that's another long story, but that's what, what's necessary in order to, you know, to make this a practical algorithm. And we got you know, some good speed ups doing this, 2.3x speed up on GM res, and 4.2x uh, speed up for another algorithm uh, called by CG stab, which is rather more challenging to do. And, and, and both of these are you know, important Department of Energy kind of codes that got sped up. So let me just uh, tell you that sometimes these mathematical transformations are not obvious. Um, and fortunately, I have lots of wonderful graduate students who managed to figure it out. Um, so this is what the classical by CG stab algorithm looks like. And if you look at the inner loop, it has a couple of matrix vector multiplies in it and lots of dot products and Saxby's and things like that. And it, and it you know, tries to come up with an optimal algorithm in some mathematical sense. So what does the new faster algorithm look like? It looks like this, and it gives you mathematically the same answer. I'm not expecting anybody to read this code, but it turns out that what we had to do was take these two matrix vector multiplies and turn them into three calls to that kernel. So I have a starting vector and I compute A times it, A squared times it, dot, 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 but for three different starting vectors. And so this, you know, made all of these matrix vector multiplies go faster. And then all of these dot products turned into one matrix multiply uh, of, you know, this, tall, this matrix times that matrix. And that's where all the speed ups came from. So I should say that when we talk about automating it later, we're not gonna automate this kind of mathematical transformation. This, this requires mathematical cleverness. We're gonna, you know, automate other parts of it. Okay, so now let me go on to machine learning. And, and so now we have lots of room for, you know, changing things. We're not going to get the same mathematical answer, but, you know, if we're just trying to, you know, train a neural net, that's okay. As long as we get the same accuracy at the end, that's our metric of success. So what is mini batch stochastic gradient descent? I'm going to pick a bunch of data points and I have a loss function L and I'm going to compute the gradient of the loss function and I'm going to go downhill, right? So that's what gradient descent looks like. And so there's a learning rate, which we're going to tune over the course of the algorithm. And so what is it, how do people parallelize this? Um, I'm going to, do, this is called uh, data parallelism. So each, pro, I'm going to uh, take my set of B data points and each processor is going to get one piece of it. We're going to replicate the weights across all the processors. Each processor will compute its gradient just with respect to the data that it owns. So that's embarrassingly parallel. And then everybody sums up their gradients to get the global gradient to be shared. So everybody goes downhill in the same direction. And so that is the classical algorithm. And the question is, how is this going? What are the bottlenecks uh, if I just try to increase the number of processors? Well, each processor is going to just get one piece of the data. So if I keep the batch size B the same, there's going to be less work for process per processor. And so I'm going to have smaller matrix operations. So the local blahs are going to run a lot slower, but also the cost of each reduction is going to grow, right? Because I have more processors. So what is an obvious way to uh, fix that, that people have you know, tried for quite a while, is just increase the batch size. I have more processors, let them work on more data, 
And so if I increase the processors, I'll just increase the batch size proportionally. That'll keep all the local work the same. And the hope is that you know, if I increase the batch size, I will converge in the same number of passes over the data. And so I'll do the same overall work with fewer reductions. So that will also decrease the, the, the parallel communication time. So this idea has been around for, for quite a while. And when people first tried it, it didn't work. And that's because the convergence can be much, much worse. It's, you know, because we're, you know, computing these gradients over different data sets and doing it over larger data sets, larger B, it had a worse convergence rate and it converged to a worse solution. So the question is, how do we fix it? So when Facebook's first attempt to, to make this work, because they obviously had very large data they were training on, their intuition was, well, if we increase the batch size by a factor of K, we should increase the learning rate by a factor of K. Because in, in some sense, intuitively, you know, you have K times as much data, so you, sh you should go K times as far in each uh, uh, gradient descent step. And that worked only up to a very small extent. They can increase, increase the batch size only up to about 1,000. So um, my graduate student, uh, Yang Yu, did a summer internship at uh, NVIDIA, and he discovered a fix to this, which was called Add Layer-Wise Adaptive Rate Scaling, or LARS. And what he noticed is that at the different levels of the neural net, the size of the gradient of the weights, the norm of the weights, uh, compared to this, the step size you want to move in, can vary by orders of magnitude. So, you know, if you have a constant learning rate at each level, you might be changing the weights at one level by, you know, 0.1% and the weights at another level by 10%. And it just didn't make any convergence sense that, you know, that you're going to change the weights at each level by vastly different amounts. And so the intuition is the learning rate is going to change but from level to level, and it's going to be chosen so that you're going to make the same relative change in their weights at every level. So every level will change by 1% rather than, you know, 0.1% to 10%. And this all, there are a lot of other things in here that if you know about machine learning, there's momentum, there's weight decay and so forth. So here's some speed ups that uh, were attained by doing this, by increasing the batch size from 256 up to 32,000. It can, same number of passes over the data, the same eventual accuracy. And it, 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 it succeeded in dropping the, the, the time from 144 hours to 11 minutes. And for ResNet 50, and, but of course, these are two very different platforms, you know, one GPU and 1,000 CPUs. This is a little bit more comparable. And going from 256 to 32,000, same number of passes over the data, same resulting accuracy. So, and so this is 16 uh, nights landing processors, and then 128x more, 2048, we got 135x speed up. So that's the super linear speed up that I alluded to earlier. So how is that possible? And it's because the local dense linear algebra on each processor was doing larger matrix multiplies. And so the local blahs ran faster. So we got super linear speed up. And so this work was, had got a lot of recognition besides that best paper prize that I mentioned. You know, a lot of media coverage. Uh, a few weeks after it was published, uh, Tencent got it down to four minutes. And uh, a year later, it was adopted by the ML Perf industry standard benchmark. So when everybody times their machine learning algorithms, they sort of use this trick. But it was all about reducing the communication. So now I'm going to get into something more theoretical, you know, or a hint of the theory that we can automate in compilers. So what I want to do is also minimize communication in training neural networks. So let me just, so what I want to do is explain how neural nets are basically nested loops. And all of our theory that we're going to, you know, develop is going to apply to code that can be thought of as nested loops accessing arrays. So I have one image with uh, W by H pixels and a certain number of channels like, you know, red, green, and blue. And I have a bunch of filters that I want to apply to it at each level of my neural net. And so these are the, the sizes of the filters. I have K of them. And what I'm going to do is take each filter, <clears throat> imagine superimposing it on my image, and then do a dot product of all the filter coefficients with all of the um, uh, image values. And I get an output of this size. And so uh, of course, I don't have just one image. I have B copies. There's another loop iteration. And so here are my seven nested loops that I eventually want to optimize. I'm going to loop over all of the images, 
you know, all of these variables up here. And I'm going to do what looks, you know, sort of like a matrix multiply, uh, where I'm going to take the value at the image and, you know, convolve it with the filter. And this is assuming I move the filter just by one at each step. In actuality, there's a shift. So when I move this left or right, there's some shift by which I move it every time. So this is what I would like to optimize. And of course, what people do in practice is they change this to matrix multiply called M to call. But it turns out we can, in theory at least, beat matrix multiply. So here are the lower bounds uh, that apply to this particular set of nested loops. And so the numerator just is going to be the number of loop iterations, just as it was for classical linear algebra. But now I have seven nested loops, so I have a product of seven you know, loop bounds. And M is going to be the cache size. And the number of words moved is going to be now not just one term anymore. It's going to depend on the relative sizes of all these loop bounds. They're going to be five terms. And any one of them could be the largest. So the first three terms are not surprisingly just the size of the output and the size of the input. And so obviously we have to move the data, at least that much data, just sort of that's trivial. So the fourth one is a lower bound that applies for large loop bounds. So this is analogous to matrix multiply, except it's much, much better. It's the number of loop bounds divided by M, the cache size. Matrix multiply would have been M to the one half. So this is much smaller. So if we have large loop bounds, we can actually asymptotically beat matrix multiply. But in reality, you, you, have, you don't have, you know, your filters aren't that big. And so what we get, this is the most practical bound, is something that looks like matrix multiply, n divided by m to the one half, but it's smaller by this constant factor, which depends on the size of your, of your filters. And so any one of these terms may be the largest. And so the question is, can we hit them? And so, and as I said, this bound here is the most practical one. It beats matrix multiply by this particular factor. And it in, applies in the common case when the data doesn't fit in cache, but one filter does. And this one is not practical because the size of the, of the, uh, of the optimal tiling doesn't fit inside the loop bounds. What we were able to do is do a computer generated proof, which means we you know, computer generated algorithms to, be, to attain all of these uh, loop bounds. So depending on the relative sizes of all of these parameters, we have a Mathematica program that will always give you the optimal tiling, no matter what these uh, optimal loop bounds are. And it beats M to call, you know, which is industry standard in data movement for various practical sizes. And we have some improved constants. This is a big omega. We've improved that. And that's about to appear in a, in a conference. So this gives you a hint that we need to automate <laughs> some of the generation of the lower bounds and the algorithms. And I should say there was another paper that was published uh, where uh, some folks independently discovered some of this, and they built a hardware accelerator based on th these uh, optimality uh, results. Okay, so now finally, let's say how this all generalizes in a way that can be automated. So just to remind you, what do we know about matrix multiply? I have three nested loops, and inside I'm accessing three arrays with these particular subscripts. And the lower bound is that it's the number of loop iterations n cubed divided by the square root of the cache size. So that's been known for a long time. And so how do we generalize that? So what we'd like to do is have as many loop iterations as we like. In fact, they don't have to be nested loops. We just have to have an iteration space, <clears throat> which is described by you know, vectors of k integers. And this could be, you know, you know in this case, it's a cube. It could be you know, any shape you want, sparse, whatever. So you can have as many nested loops as you like. You can have as many arrays as you like. And the subscripts can be anything, as long as they're affine functions of the, uh, loop, uh, iter of the loop indices. So that's what we would like to be able to generate lower bounds and optimal algorithms for, any code that looks like this. So what do we know? Let me tell you the lower bound first. We have a theorem that says that for any code that looks like this, the lower bound is the number of loop iterations divided by the cache size to this magical exponent, <clears throat> E sub HBL. What does HBL stand for? It's, it's the acronym of three famous mathematicians, Holder, centuries ago, and Brass Camp and Leap from the 70s, 
<clears throat> excuse me. But there have been some recent generalizations that we depend on by uh, my colleague, Mike Christ at Berkeley, Terry Tao at UCLA, and various others in order to, to generate this. And you know, I don't have time to go into the details, but you know, happy to give you pointers to you know, other talks I've given on this topic. And so that's the lower bound. And so you know, in the case of matrix multiply, it's n cubed over m to the 1 half. For other code, this exponent could be anything. And we also have a theorem that says there exists an optimal tiling that attains this lower bound. No matter what your code looks like, we can, up to some constant factor, find a tile that actually hits this lower bound. And so I'm not going to you know, go into the proof. It's rather complicated, but it is possible. So that sounds like we've solved all the world's problems, but no, <laughs> not at all. So let me say what's left to do. For one thing, dealing with small loop bounds. So in particular, matrix vector multiply, for example, uh, you can think of that as a special case of matrix matrix multiply, where one of the matrices is very skinny. And we know you can't optimize that. There's no data reuse in matrix vector multiply. But you know, so the question is, what do you do in that case? Another example would be convolutional neural nets. I showed you that, where you have you know, small filters. In that case, uh, you, know, you, you, know, you have to do something special. And so uh, in the case of neural nets, we, you know, we did that one by hand and we came up with a lower bound and wrote some Mathematica code to automatically tile it. So what is a step in the direction of automation? If all the subscripts of all your arrays are particularly simple, like i comma j or whatever, and your iteration space is you know, just simple nested loops, so you get a parallel pipe ed, then we can prove a tighter and attainable lower bound. So in other words, matrix vector multiply you know, will be treated in the, you know, and we'll say what's optimal for that. And it's kind of the obvious thing, no data reuse. Um, but it, this it, new lower bound kind of interpolates between matrix vector multiply and matrix matrix multiply, no matter what the dimensions of the matrices are. So the next issue, what's left, the next open problem are dealing with dependencies. And there's been a bunch of recent work on that. Uh, again, we've done a bunch of, a bunch of it by hand. So for example, uh, I mentioned we could do Gaussian elimination. Obviously, Gaussian elimination, there's some dependencies there. You can't do the operations in arbitrary order. You get the wrong answer, unlike matrix multiply. Uh, Floyd Warshall, it's the same thing. You have to do, you know, traverse the graph in a specific order. And we figured out how to do that by hand. But it's sort of an open question of how to do that more generally. And I have a, I've had a conjecture for a while, but I haven't proved it yet. Um, and then we need more realistic performance models than simply alpha, beta, gamma, you know, counting the number of messages, counting the number of words moved, and the number of flops. And I'll just have a, one example of variable precision, because that one we do know how to deal with, one slide on that. But more generally, we can have heterogeneous processors, accelerators, you know, different network topologies. Sometimes reads and writes have different costs. So life is complicated. And the question is, how do we take that all into account? Because all of our you know, practical, you know, implementations depend on that. And of course, we want to automate all this, which is, you know, the last few minutes of the talk about what compilers can potentially do for all this. So let me just talk about variable precision, because we know how to solve that. It's easy. So let's just do matrix multiply. So I want to multiply A by B and get C, but I want a C to be in different precision than A and B. So for example, uh, this is not unusual. A and B come in in very low precision, you know, 16 bits. I want to get the answer in 32 bits or something like that. So, so in that case, H would be two. I want double precision. Uh, there is an example where we want H to be six. <clears throat> That's used to make uh, floating point addition associative. And I, I recently served in the IEEE 754 floating point standards committee, and we added new a floating point instruction to the standard which makes floating point addition associative, which you know, some people care about that for reproducibility re reasons. So, but you need a, an accumulator of size six words, it turns out. And uh, so anyway, there are a lot of different examples here. So anyway, the theory is, so we wanna do an optimal tiling of matrix multiply where C is stored in higher precision than A and B. And the theory says there is a lower bound and it's larger by a factor of the square root of H and the optimal tiling exists, but it's no longer square. Um, here are the sizes of the optimal tiles. If H were one, th these would all be square root of M by square root of M square tiles. 
but for A and B, you know, the number of rows and columns differ, you know, by this factor here. H is either in the numerator or the denominator. And so that's, you know, a, sort of the simplest case to extend to a more realistic model. But now let me just talk very, very briefly about recent work that, you know, several groups have been doing. Uh, this is all very recent and, and raw kind of stuff toward integration into compilers. So I want to mention some papers by Olivier et al., which appeared in PLDI uh, 20 and 21. So his motivation was to extend our HBL lower bounds that I mentioned, you know, you know, were lower bounds for arbitrary nested loops to deal with some dependencies. And he built some, um, some automatic tools to generate both the lower bounds and to try to get uh, you know, optimal tilings for them. And in the 20 paper, he applied them to all the polybench benchmarks and compared them to the known best uh, you know, tilings and, and got pretty close in both, case, both cases. So you know, I sort of recommend uh, looking at that uh, since it's, you, know, you may have heard him give these talks already in, at PLDI. So on to work that our group has been doing. So this is a collaboration with hardware accelerator builders. So, Everybody's building special purpose accelerators and they wanna you know, make it easy to write code for it. So that's a compiler challenge. And so this paper appeared in ISCA last year. And so what we wanna do is optimally map multi-layer DNNs to accelerators. And so now accelerators are complicated. You know, they have all these you know, hardware restrictions as to the sizes of the you know, little matrix multiplies you can stick in them. They have different kinds of memories. Um, you, you know, you, and since we're doing multiple layers, you know, there are, we, we don't just do one layer at a time, write it back to memory. We can sort of uh, you know, have a pipeline going through multiple layers. And so what we did was we took all of our performance models and we reformulated them as mixed integer linear programming problems to minimize some sort of weighted average of memory movement and compute cycles and, and tried to write lots and lots of constraints. You know, the, some came from the algorithm, you know, you know, what are the loop bounds? Some came from the hardware, tried to capture all the things that you know that we had a you know, that are now too complicated to have a closed form a formula for anymore, and we can so we came up with a tool to do this, an automatic tool, and we compared it to many other schedulers, including some that you may know about, you know, Poly and Pluto and Tiramisu, and we compared them on several benchmarks and got good speed ups, you know, compared to on this particular accelerator that was being built by the others in our lab, and we got up to you know. 2.5x speed up and much lower energy, but also by having formulated this as a, as a, as a concrete integer linear programming problem, you know, we could just use tools that exist for solving those from Mathematica or whatever, and it was much uh, faster runtime to come up with these solutions rather than these uh, you know, other algorithms that people had used. And finally, my last slide, I guess I'm on time, and this is work by my graduate student in a larger team, and what Grace is building is a system called MOST, which is uh, a system that's going to let people you know, try all these different schedules out that come from these theoretical suggestions. And it's sort of uh, motive inspired by Halide. Uh, and it's, being, it's a new system called Systel, uh, which is uh, now called EXO. So this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Rodden Kelly and, you know, and a postdoc of his who's still at Berkeley. And so we're trying to automate some of this automatic code generation. And the hope is that this could map to other backends in the future, like TVM. Okay, so let me just say this is joint work over many years with a lot of different people, and I'm not going to try to mention all their names. I will just highlight Kathy Yellick, uh, with whom I collaborate both on avoiding communication and raising two children. And that sounds like a contradiction, but you know you just have to be careful what kind of communication you avoid, and it all works. And so. Uh, for more details, we have a website, which is, I have to admit, is not completely up to date, but there's a linear algebra survey there from Acton America. And we're in writing a, a book for SIAM. Uh, it's work in progress. Hopefully it'll come out in the next year, which covers much more than linear algebra. And I also teach a parallel programming course um, uh, every spring semester. It's going on now. And we actually uh, teach it to a bunch of universities uh, around the world uh, you know, with NSF support. So all the remote students get uh, NSF supercomputer accounts to do our homework. And it, it, it covers parallel computing in general, but we also have some lectures on these communication avoiding algorithms. So finally, to conclude, I'll just say it's time to think about redesigning all of linear algebra, machine learning, you know, anything that smells like nested loops. And uh, hopefully the compilers can help us all do that. 
And what does it all have in common? Don't communicate. And I'll stop there.